Welcome to Westlake Church's premiere for Sunday the 14th of March 2021. I'm Claire Walton, I'm one of the elders and um, welcome to you if you are here for a hundredth time or if you are here for the first time and if you're watching us for the first time um, and particularly if you'd like to get hold of us to join the Zoom straight after this premiere or, or for any other reason, uh, please contact us on contact us at westlakechurch.com. Uh, if you do join the service, we will actually be able to send you the link to the Zoom. So, you know, please don't, don't hold back. Um, we are going to um, come together. So let's, let's pray as we start. Dear Lord, thank you that as we um, look today at seeking God's power, uh, that we will, we will be praying, Lord, strengthen my hands. And uh, Lord, we ask you to show us your power as we meet together. In your name, amen. Right, last week we had um, some worship led by Sue Rinaldi. Uh, Sue has done us a few more songs, which is brilliant. So she is going to uh, lead those songs for us now. I'll hand over to her.
is your faithfulness I will rest in your promises my confidence Obviously, Easter is coming up. Uh, we are hoping um, that we will be able to meet together. So um, there's a, a short promo that uh, James has put together for what's going on at Easter um, so that you can get up to date already. I want to share with you something that I am really excited about. I, I don't know about you, but uh, it feels to me that all the weeks recently have uh, just been kind of running into one. Uh, and everything's been mundane and much of a muchness. Uh, but right now we, we are heading towards Easter. And what I'm incredibly excited about is our Holy Weeks uh, services, special events. And uh, some of these are going to be happening online like this. Uh, and some of them, we're excited to tell you, are going to happen 
face to face. Holy Week is the epicentre of our faith. When we remember uh, the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus and everything that that means for us, uh, Holy Week is all about the gospel and the saving power of God. And, and that's what we are going to be focusing on from Wednesday. So let me tell you a little bit about what we are planning and you're going to be getting more details about this the closer we get to Holy Week. So on Wednesday the 31st of March uh, we're going to be reflecting on the cross and uh, online in a Zoom gathering Paul Woodkey is going to be helping us to reflect on the cross uh, using the spiritual classic from Thomas Akempis called The Imitation of Christ. Uh, and we'll be talking to Paul and giving you some details about what that's all be about. Now, on Monday, Thursday, which is uh, the 1st of April, uh, when we remember the very first celebration of the Lord's Supper, uh, what we're going to do is, uh, again, gathering on Zoom, uh, we are going to have uh, the Lord's Supper together. So get your bread and wine ready, and we're going to remember that very first celebration of communion and share communion uh, and have a little reflection on that. Now, on Good Friday, uh, which is the 2nd of April, what we're going to do is we're going to put on our YouTube channel a series of images uh, and also scripture passages that will take you with Jesus uh, right the way through from his arrest uh, through the to all the events about him being condemned, uh, him being whipped, uh, uh, him being crucified and being laid in the tomb. And so what you're going to do is you're going to journey with Jesus to the cross and have ch a chance to stop and reflect and think about the significance of that for your own life. And you'll be able to do that at any time uh, through Good Friday. Just grab a coffee, grab a seat, get your screen ready and journey with Jesus to the cross. Now, on Holy Saturday, the 3rd of April, uh, we, we're going to go a little bit deeper and uh, I, I'm going to give uh, what I'm really pretentiously calling a theological lecture. So we're going to think deeply about the theology and think about connecting to the cross, what the cross does and uh, how we connect to it and the impact that that makes on our life. Uh, and we'll have some questions a chance for questions afterwards. And now here's a bit that I am really excited about. On Easter Sunday, uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're allowed to meet up to 15 people outside. So we're going to have a series of gatherings uh, like the home churches that we had with up to 15 people. Uh, we, we are going to celebrate uh, what Jesus did for us uh, through the empty tomb and then we're going to share communion together and afterwards if you want to go for a walk or whatever uh, the, all these events will happen outside except one which will meet in the church building and then later on uh, if you can't make any of those or, or feel it wouldn't be safe for you to do that uh, we'll have a, a short YouTube service with a Zoom meeting after. So Holy Week is going to be a week just filled with spiritual significance for us as a church. Uh, take note of the dates, plan to get involved. Maybe you can't get involved in all of them, but have a little look at the ones that you want to be involved in. And let's make this week a, a week that really has an impact on our heads, and on our hearts as we get to the very centre of our faith and think about the empty tomb uh, and the cross. Look forward to connecting with you during Holy Week. We love it when we can introduce people to the congregation uh, in new ways. Um, now we've got an interview here with uh, Yako and Roxanne uh, who have uh, join, you joined the congregation a few months ago 
Um, but it's great that we will be able to find out a bit more about them as James interviews them. Well, we want to uh, welcome you. You're doing a, a little feature in all of our services, uh, helping us get to know uh, one another. And I wanted to uh, introduce Roxanne and Yako. And uh, I'm just going to ask you just a little bit about yourselves and, and where, you, where you're from originally. And uh, how, how did you end up in Neon and in Westlake? Sure. Um, we're both from South Africa. Roxanne and I, and uh, we originally came to Switzerland at the end of 2018 uh, for me to study. Oh. Um, so yeah, I, I did one year of full-time study in Lausanne in 2019. And during that year, Roxanne and I both uh, got work in Geneva. And so towards the end of the year, um, decided we will move a bit closer to work to shorten the commute. And, um, and yeah, so we were looking into we didn't want to live in Geneva as such, too busy. We like the yeah. smaller town. So we, we found Neil as a prospective place. And at the same time, we started looking into local churches to join. And Westlake came up on the Google search. Good uh, point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so yeah, I was immediately attracted to, to Westlake. Um, one of the things that really stuck out to me was the men's Bible study. In fact, that Paul Lutke leads. And um, that was a, a strong draw card. And, uh, and yeah, so we, we ended up settling in Neil in about May last year right. and, uh, yeah, connected with the church at the, at the first opportunity and felt a very warm welcome. And, mm -hmm. and so we've been with, with, uh, Westlake since. And what an odd year it has been. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think you, you were involved when we did picnic chart, uh, I, I but since then, you know, we've, we've been mainly, uh, meeting online uh, and I, we were going to ask you what, what kind of things are, are your hopes and prayers for yourselves and for the church uh, as, as hopefully we begin to see kind of COVID uh, rolling back a little bit? Uh, well for me I, I really look forward to getting back to meeting together and maybe this year doing a picnic church again that was yeah, really enjoyable getting to know everyone and being in a nice, relaxed environment. And yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and for me, I would, I, I agree with that. Um, it, it's really nice to meet in person and we've had the opportunity to do that in smaller groups. Yeah. Um, but what I also hope for the church is despite the circumstances um, that it's, it's able to be successful in its strategy for this year, which is really to to make disciples um, uh, of Jesus and ones who can have an impact in the community around them. Yeah. So I really wish that that is true for Westlake this year, no matter what the circumstances, no matter how creative we need to be uh, yeah. about to achieve that. Yeah, and I think both of you are part of a life group, aren't you? Has that been helpful to you this year, even uh, when we haven't been able to meet face to face? Absolutely. It's been a total lifesaver. Um, we meet regularly and the people in that group um, have become friends of ours, good right. friends, and we visit in each other's homes, we break bread together. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's been very special. We've we felt a very strong connection to people in the local community, and that's what we were hoping for, you know, not yeah. just to not just to attend a church, but to to meet people and to knit them into our lives and yeah. yeah, forge relationships, and that's happened primarily through the small groups. Yeah. So if you're not part of a small group, uh, we are coming after you. I've told you before. Uh, so he, here's here's uh, someone telling you. Uh, we, I think, especially at the moment when so so much of what we would normally do to meet people uh, isn't open to us. These. Uh, opportunities to meet in small groups are really vital uh, to to being church, not just going to church. But listen, we we are delighted that you're part of Westlake and uh, glad that you've failed at home and 
Uh, really looking forward to your ministry to us as well. Uh, I know from the people in your small group that they've really appreciated your contribution. Uh, so hopefully now, when we do get back together again, uh, if you haven't met uh, Yako and Roxanne, you'll be able to uh, go up and say hi. So thanks for, for just taking some time to uh, speak to us and introduce yourselves. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hand over to James now for the message on seeking God's power. But before I do that, say so if anybody would like to join us for the Zoom call, uh, please do email us on contact us at westlakechurch.com and I can send you the link. Uh, the Zoom call follows straight after the premiere, so probably uh, yeah, about 5.40 ish. Um, and um, it would be great to see you there. Um, and if not, say please do contact does um, and um, yeah it would be great to see you so let's just pray as James talks Lord I do lift this message up to you I thank you that you have um, yeah you've put words into James's mouth that he, you want him to to give to send to us today so Lord I lift this time to you and I pray that you will use James mightily in your name amen and over to James now. Chapter 6. When word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me, so I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. Then the fifth time, Sanballat sent his aid to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it is true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king, and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king, so come, let us confer together. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work, and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. Never give in, never give in, never, never, never. In nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in, except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force, never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. Winston Churchill made the, those impassioned pleas never to give up and never to give in at probably the lowest point uh, in British history. It was 1941 and Britain had suffered defeat after defeat and Churchill was under tremendous pressure uh, to surrender, to give up and give in. And his message for the people who were pressurising him to give up was never give up, never give in. And in some ways that message of never giving up and never giving in is a great summary of the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. In fact, Max Lucado in one of his books actually calls Winston Chur uh, sorry, Nehemiah the Winston Churchill of the Old Testament. You see, just like uh, Churchill, Nehemiah was very conscious that he'd been called to do something significant. If you look in verse 3, you'll see that he talks about doing a, a great work. So what was that great work? Well, we, we need a little bit of a history lesson to get that. Uh, you might remember that the people of 
Israel were, were split into two nations. There was the northern tribe of Israel, and that was eventually invaded by Assyria and, and carried off into exile, and, and we never really saw those ten tribes again. The southern uh, nation of Judah uh, lasted a little bit longer, but eventually the Babylonians invaded them, uh, took over Jerusalem, and took most of the people away to exile in Babylonia. But then, uh, in 539 BC, King Cyrus of Persia defeated the Babylonians. And, and one of his policies was that exiled people should go home. And, and so the people of Israel, most of them in exile in Babylonia, went back to Jerusalem. But a little bit later on, Nehemiah, uh, we encounter him. Uh, he was the cupbearer to the king. Now that's much more than being a waiter. Uh, it was a, a job with uh, power and privilege and prestige. We, we might call it a special advisor today. It was somebody who was particularly trusted. And Nehemiah, when he heard that despite the fact that, that the people had gone back to Jerusalem, Jerusalem was still in ruins and the temple hadn't been rebuilt, felt called by God to go back to Jerusalem and to lead the people in rebuilding the walls and the temple. Now, here is a tremendously important point that you need to get clear in your mind. When Nehemiah says that he was called to do a great work, a great task, the greatness did not mean that it was a big job, a big task. It wasn't even about the fact that it was important. The greatness of Nehemiah's task came from the fact that God had called him to do it. And that's the focal thing that I want you to remember. A great task is whatever God has called us to do for him. So when we meet up uh, in chapter 6, Nehemiah is trying to go on with this great task, but he is coming under tremendous pressure, just like Churchill, to give up and give in. Now, that pressure is coming mainly from people who... When the exiles went off to Babylonia, new people came and settled in Israel. And when the exiles returned, they, they were opposed to Nehemiah rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and re-establishing the people there. And so they put him under tremendous pressure. They, they tried to distract him, if you, you read back in Nehemiah 6. Uh, they also tried to spread what we would call today fake news. They, they put a letter around that falsely accused Nehemiah of trying to start a rebellion against the Persians. And also, they, they tried to tempt him to sin. Uh, if, if you read back in Nehemiah 6, you'll see that that Nehemiah was tempted to go into the temple. Now that doesn't seem very serious, but actually he was being tempted to go into the area of the temple that it was only allowed for priests to go. And that would have been a sin so serious that he would have had to have given up his role as a leader of God's people. And of course the, the job was big and it was exhausting and there must have been a pressure from that physically uh, just to feel so exhausted that it would have been easier to give up. And all of this pressure to give up and give in is, is kind of summed up for us in verse 6. So let's look at verse 6 in detail. And this is what it says. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will be too weak for the work and the work will not be completed. And so Nehemiah is saying that there are people and circumstances trying to intimidate him, put him under pressure to give up what God had called him to do. Uh, and the NIV translates that as their hands will get too weak for the work. But actually the, the Hebrew words there are a figure of speech. And the figure of speech literally meant that their hands will be too slack. And what that figure of speech meant was to be discouraged. So when your hands were slack, you were being discouraged. So actually, if you look back to Ezra 4.4, uh, the same phrase is translated, the people around them set out to discourage, to make the hands slack of the people of Judah. 
So when you think about it, having slack hands, that, that figure of speech meant to be emotionally intimidated by what's going on in your life, to be so discouraged that you're tempted to give up and give in and, and some challenge that you're facing in life. <clears throat> and I think the New Living Translation uh, really captures what Nehemiah meant here. Uh, and it translates verse 6 like this. They were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and so stop the work. But the great thing is, just like Churchill, Nehemiah didn't give up and he didn't give in in what he'd been called to do. He didn't give in to that discouragement. And here's how he responded to that pressure to give up and give in. Here's how he responded to the discouragement. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. He prayed that God would strengthen his hands. He prayed that God would give him the emotional and the physical strength to persevere in the face of discouragement. I came across this quote uh, from a book on prayer that I read a couple of years ago. And it said, prayerless people cut themselves off from God's power. And the frequent result is that familiar feeling of being overwhelmed, overrun, beaten down, pushed around, defeated. And surprising numbers of people are willing to live life like that. Well, Nehemiah wasn't, but, but I suspect that sometimes that we are. I, I wonder if that might be describing how you're feeling at the moment. That because of what you're facing in life. You're feeling a bit overwhelmed and overrun or beaten down or pushed around or defeated. And because of that, you feel tempted to give up. I, I was talking to some people earlier on this week and saying that, that we are a year into handling this pandemic. And I have to say that I have never known a time when so many people are so discouraged. And I, I really do think that many of us are on the verge of giving up and giving in. We are so discouraged. And if that's you, here's the main thing, the number one thing that I want you to remember, the main lesson that Nehemiah has for us today, that God's power to persevere comes through prayer. I want you to fix that in your mind. If you remember nothing else about today, remember this, that God's power to persevere comes through prayer. You see, if you read on in Nehemiah 6, you'll discover that God did strengthen Nehemiah's hands and they did complete the work that God had called him to do. And over the last few weeks, we've been thinking about seeking God, seeking God glory, the fact that God seeks us. And what I want us to realise today is that when we're feeling discouraged, when we feel that it's easier to give up and give in than to keep going, that we should seek God's power to persevere in prayer. Now, I'm not a mind reader, but I think I know what some of you are thinking right now. And you're saying, well, well, that's fine for Nehemiah. You know, he was a great man of God. He was called to a great work for God. But me, I'm just an ordinary person living an ordinary life. And if you're thinking that, let me tell you, you are dead wrong. Because you see, to be part of God's people is to be called, like Nehemiah, to a great work. Do you remember that earlier on we were thinking about the fact that a great work is being called by God to do something for God? So think about it. If you're, if you're a Christian, you're called to be like Christ. That's a great work. If you're a Christian parent, whatever the age of your children, you're called to mentor them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And I know that that's a great work. 
And if you're married, you're called to build a marriage that reflects Jesus' love for the church. And that's a great work. And as his disciples, Jesus said to us, as the Father sends me, I'm sending you. In other words, we are called to the great work of going into our families and our homes and our workplaces and where we live to represent Jesus, to be his hands and feet and to speak on his behalf. And boy, that's a great work. And what about us as a church? We have vision 2020. We are thinking about the fact that we are called to make a kingdom impact in this world through spiritual formation. And that's a great work that we are called to. I think we need to remember one of the great principles of the kingdom of God. That in the kingdom of God there are no insignificant people and no insignificant places. That whoever you are, whatever you're called to do, and whatever you're called to do it in the kingdom of God, in God's eyes, that has significance. But you know, just as we realise that, we need to realise that just like Jeremiah, we'll come under pressure to give up and give in. And just like like Nehemiah, sometimes that's going to calm, that pressure will come from people. And sometimes, like, Je- like ne- Nehemiah, maybe it will feel that the-, the task is just so big that it would be easier to give up on it. Maybe we'll be feeling emotionally and physically exhausted. And I think that maybe many of us are feeling that like that right now. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're so discouraged that, that you want to give up and give, on, give in right now. You want to give up on your marriage. Maybe give up on a ministry God's called you to. Or to give up on a friendship. And if you feel like that, I want you to watch this video. video because I think it's a visual parable that teaches us what God wants to do when we feel the pressure to give up and to give in. Because you see, just like Derek Redmond's father, 
God wants to come alongside us. Do you remember that the main name for the Holy Spirit in the book of John is the paraclete? And that literally means in Greek, the one who comes alongside. And whenever it would be easier for us to give up, God through his spirit wants to come alongside us and get us back on our feet and give us the strength to keep going. Because you remember, how do we call God alongside us? God's power to persevere comes through prayer. I wonder if you notice that Nehemiah's prayer was, was, was just four words long. Now strengthen my hands. And I think sometimes that, that we kind of believe that, that we need to impress God with our eloquence or our vocabulary or the length of our prayers if he's going to answer. And we forget the fact that, that sometimes, just like Nehemiah, we need to pray things that are simple and significant and heartfelt. And as I think of my own life, at the very lowest point in my life, I believe that I prayed my most significant prayer. And it was also my most simple prayer. It was simply three words, God help me. And there's maybe some of you today and you need to pray a simple and a significant prayer. God, strengthen my hand in my marriage. Give me the strength to keep going. God, strengthen my hand in my relationship with my children. God, strengthen my hand in, in the face of that temptation to give in. God strengthen my hand in the face of that temptation to sin in that particular way that seems to constantly defeat me. God strengthen my hand to represent you better at work. Maybe what some of us need to do right now is simply close our eyes and think of a situation where it would be so much easier to give up and give in and simply pray those four words. God, strengthen my hand. Amen.